So a big hand, please, for Thomas Sheridan. Can you, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, when I first got the email from Andy, and it said, would you be interested in doing the Glastonbury Symposium? Uh, for some reason, I thought it was the Glastonbury Festival. <laughs> and uh, the first thing that popped into my head was Kayan West demolishing Bohemian Rhapsody, so I immediately said no. And then someone explained to me, no, it's not that, it's something else. And then, oh yeah, and then I looked and I saw the videos online. So it's, it, I'm much happier to be here, especially with the way that festival's gone. But uh, it's a beautiful hall, and thank you for coming out, and the turnout is fantastic, and I'm delighted to be here. Although I, I wasn't sure if, if what I talk about would be, po you know, well, I don't say popular, but if it would be, you know, pertinent or anything like that. But things, the world is changing and things are changing. And uh, I suppose what drew me to this topic, now, I, I, was a, I was a weirdo growing up. When other kids are watching football, I was reading books about serial killers, cults, and uh, magic, black magic and the occult. And uh, I'm glad I did because I ended up working on Wall Street, so that really helped. <laughs> and uh, so I think a few weeks ago, someone said, was they introduced me to someone else, and they said, oh, here's Thomas, he's an expert on evil. And I burst out laughing, and then I said, you know what, it's kind of true. It is, and then I started to think of it like in that sense, and I guess ultimately I'm trying to discover is there a kind of a spiritual nature to evil in the context of, say, working behind enemy lines. And I think from a very early age that was about, because when I think of all the synchronicities and circumstances that have happened that eventually brought me to writing a, a best-selling book on, on the subject, was, it was quite magical and it was quite very, extremely synchronistic in many ways. Uh, I went to New York quite young, uh, and one of the first things I did was, after I'd seen the sites, was to go look for this, the location of this notorious cult to try and meet them, not to join them, called the, the Process Church of the Final Judgment, and they were based in Yonkers, New York, and there was a, a whole thing that, a, a, around court, a place called Van Cortland Park in the North Bronx. And uh, so at 19, I was, look, I was searching for these people to try and meet them, and I never did. But I managed to learn about the world in a different way because as, more, as this group got more and more clandestine and mysterious, the more they seemed to be connected to big government. There seemed to be a connection between a specific kind of behavior, mass entertainment and government. And then I played in the music business. I went to work. I, I learned, I, studied to be a graphic designer, and I went to work in, in these, these companies, large corporations, and it suddenly began to dawn on me that the profiles and the criminal psychology and the, the other profiles of these, these serial killers was a perfect analogy for the corporations I was working for. It worked exactly the same way. There was no difference between Ted Bundy and, say, Raytheon or any kind of major corporation. It operated in the same function. It was basically a harvesting of, of human energy through a, a very pathological and extreme manner, debt, and to take what they want from them. Now, it's a very difficult subject to talk about because there's, a, there's an awful lot of misunderstandings about it, especially now. When I was starting to talk about this, I, I was like, a, pretty much a lone voice in the wilderness. Now you, you see it on TV shows and everything, and it, there's loads of popular books about it. And uh, it's, it, you have one, set, the one side you have people thinking it's all serial killers, and it's all mass murderers, it's all the most evil people on the earth that humanity could ever possibly give us. You know, Simon Cowell. And <laughs> on the other hand, it's, it's, you know, someone falls out with their ex-husband or their ex-girlfriend and they start calling them names and stuff like that because it's, you go, it's just like these health, these health sites on the internet. You have a cold, within five minutes you start thinking you have cancer. 
it's the same thing, you know, they have a bad relationship, it breaks up, it breaks up, and then they go on the internet and they start thinking, my ex-wife is a psychopath or something like that. It doesn't work like that. But I'll tell you how it does work. You're in a relationship with someone for years, you're in an organization, you're in a business, you're at work, and you, you come across a character who, at first, seems a little bit too, shall we say, in your face. Slightly, they're very eager to please. They can be very glib. They're, they may see themselves as being more just the life and soul of the party than they somehow are. There's a kind of a, a try-hard nature to them. If you enter into a romantic relationship with them, they come full, it's, it's you know, it's the, the black, what they call the chocolates, those black magic chocolate man. It's like that, it's the, it's, it's the perfect romance or whatever, very, very quickly, like that. But at the same time too, there's something inside you is saying, there's something not right here. It's, they haven't done anything wrong. There's, there's just something not right. It's, it's too slick, it's too smooth, it's too, it's too forced, it's too superficial or something. But, not, and, but then you, sl you, you slowly become conditioned to it. You're in a, a workplace and there's a guy who goes around and he's, he's brown nosing the bosses and you just say, ah, that's, that's Charlie, that's his way, that's how he is. He's just there, uh, he's, he's a sycophant, whatever. And there are regular sycophants too. And then someday, this might be your wife, your husband, your family member, uh, your co-worker, your boss, whatever, person you're not in a club with, and uh, something happens. Something happens, and uh, something goes wrong. And this individual suddenly looks at you in such a way that what you are staring at doesn't feel like a human being that you're looking at. And they've broken cover. And they will absolutely have, for a split second, a look of extreme malice and hatred in their eyes, like they would cut your head off if they had, a, if they had an ax and wouldn't think twice about it. And then you might say, oh, you know, that's not what happened. And then they suddenly go, bang, and they're back to like, hey, this kind of thing. I used to work, and I can't name the company because I'll get sued, but I used to work for this one guy, this one large corporation, and it was in the US, and it was, a, it was a Labor Day weekend, which is the last weekend of the summer that Americans, Americans work much harder than we do. They're, they're basically, you want to talk about like slaves to the system, it's much worse there. And so they get very few holidays off. And they're, and they're, and so it was Labor Day weekend, and it was the Friday evening, and this guy that I worked for called Frank, that's his real name, and I was outside his office, and he was always very good to me. He was like, we cracked jokes, very Italian-American guy, you know, hey, dummy, and that kind of thing, you know. And he was always taking me out to lunch. And uh, it's, I'm the last one in the office, and I'm ready to go home. And everyone's left the, uh, this big office. And all of a sudden, I hear him put the phone on speakerphone. You all speakerphones, and he types in a number. And he goes, he goes, John? He goes, yeah. Hi, this is Frank here. He goes, yeah, what's up, Frank? And he exploded. Now, when I say he exploded, it was like if a human bomb could explode, like, from their inside, with rage and hatred, that's what it was like. It was, it, it had a force that was like the wind. You know, like, I could actually almost feel it. In, in the two cubicles away. And I went like this, and, and there was one of their fellows still working with me, and he, uh, and he was still around, and he went like this, oh, what's going on? He then proceeded to call up everybody on his team, oh, these were all senior managers, and saying, and these are people who were already in airports, going back to their families, on trains, already at home. And he, he says, if you're not in this office in the next three hours, you won't have a job on Monday when you get back. And they were all shaking on the phone. Oh, yeah, 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 please, 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 please. And so he, 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 then he puts the phone down like that, very calm, right? And I'm the only one in the office at this point now. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, here comes a monster to kill me. And he comes out of the office like this. He struts out like this and he looks at me and he goes, have a great weekend. It was an act. 
It was an act to completely and utterly control them through terror, fear, and intimidation. And that was the moment that it hit me. And I started those other moments too, and I, and I started to see it, that the, the serial killers and these particular type of individuals share the same traits. They have, he looked 25 years younger when he stepped out of the office. He had quite literally harvested the emotional and psychic energy of these people he had tortured. He looked like a young guy again. He practically danced out of the office door. Now that to me was spooky to begin with. That was really bizarre. The sudden change, like if any of us has an intense emotional situation, there's a long period of the heart, the heart rate returning to normal, you stop sweating, and then you have a kind of a, I wouldn't say post-traumatic stress, but you have a kind of a, it's, 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 you're ruminating on it for a while afterwards. I wish that didn't happen. They're switches, they're switches, they're like binary code, on, off, on, off. In 1947, an American psychiatrist called Herbie Kleckley wrote a book called The Mask of Sanity. It's one of the greatest books ever written, and it was quite popular at the time. And he discovered, and he said, that there were people who were basically serial killers who didn't kill. And how they, but they, they hid in society by play acting and, and copying and mirroring. Very, that's one, another way you can always tell them. They tend to mirror. If they're interested in you, they will pretend to love everything you loved, all your hobbies, everything you enjoyed, in order to get you to, and it's all very spooky how it changes the hormonal levels in your brain and everything. It'll even rewire your neural pathway, so there's even an epigenetic aspect to it. And that's why when your involvement at one of these ends, either and you were married to one, or you were one was your boss or in an organization where they got everybody, one, we had that discussion we had before at break, where they said, you know, stay away from organizations. Unfortunately, that's true, I have to agree with that. Even the best intentions, the way our world is set up, organizations, because of that pyramidal structure, are perfectly suited to these predators because it emulates the food chain in the natural world. But it's a, it's a psychic chain and they run straight to the top because they don't bother with the bottom. They will kill anything on the way to get to the top, but they'll do it through mind games, mind games. And in Harvey, Cle Harvey Klecky's book, he spoke about that he would interview these people and they wouldn't even know what emotions were. Now, there are people who don't have, who don't have strong emotional, uh, what's the word, reception or, I don't like that word empathy. I, I, it's, it's, it's actually a very misleading term. It's a very, very, it's really compassion is what the word is. But there'll be types of people who, they don't show their emotions or they don't have strong emotions. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that have no emotions. Like for instance, Robert Hare from the University of uh, British Columbia wrote a book called Without Conscience back in the 1990s, a very good book. And uh, he was contacted by the actress who was married to uh, Tom Cruise, she was in the movie that The Die For, the Australian lady, Nicole Kidman, thank you. And um, she said to him, I'm playing a, a part of a real female psychopath who had her husband murdered for fame. How does, uh, he, he said, she said to him, how would you, how would, it, how, would it, how, would it, how would I get myself into the character? And he said, imagine walking down the street and you saw a terrible accident. A child was run over by a car. And then the, the mother, you saw the mother screaming. You saw the man behind the car getting out and going, oh my God, oh my God, what did I do, what did I do? And you don't know why she's screaming or why he cares. But you know it must be important because everyone else seems to be doing it except you and feeling except you. And then you go home and you sit in front of the mirror and you practice the look on her face when she saw her child being hit by a car. Because that's the only way you'll ever plausibly survive in society. Otherwise, you're just blank. Now, I wrote a book called Defeat the Demons where I interviewed two, two, two psychopaths, two confirmed ones, and uh, it was the most horrible experience of my life. They knew what I was interviewing them for, I had to basically pay them, and they I was insulted for about two hours straight in the most disgusting way because they knew I needed them. But they, I got tremendous information off them. 
again, what was looking at me was not a human being because they could switch off the mask. They knew I was. They, they knew what they were dealing with, and they didn't care. And uh, I was not right for days after that. I was not right for days. I didn't feel right. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I, I just. It even affected my dreaming and things like that. And so it was uh, there. It, 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 it's hard to describe the greatest predator on this planet that doesn't kill. What they do is they get you to kill yourself. You may start a, a spiritual group, a church, an organization, anything like that. Anything, a project, making a film, anything, making a movie, any, making a, doing it in a band, anything. And they won't, they won't, won't have, they're the ones that will have the least talent. But they're very good at manipulating superficial brown nosing. Now get in there, and they will immediately, within no time, start playing everyone off against everyone else. And it'll be liars, it'll be liars. Uh, they, 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 I mean, they will lie in ways that you, a normal person couldn't fathom. Like, for instance, like, you know, I've, I said to people, like, I, I often get emails from people who are describing they may be working with a psychopath at work, and they'll say, they'll say things to me like, uh, you know, I want to, should I go up and confront them? Should I go, just take them on? And I says, do nothing. Try to get a transfer to another office. Stay away. And then they say, well, what would happen if I got him in the bathroom? And I say, you know, you know. I says, he will leave that bathroom. He will download child porn onto your computer and then call the cops. That's what a psychopath does. That's what they do. They will go into a group and they will start having affairs with several women in the group at the same time. But at the same time, tell those women, you're the special one, you're the special one, you're the special one. She's a nutcase. That's a great way you can tell them. A lot of these womanizer type psychopath stuff, every, every one of their exes is a lunatic because they do not want the new one communicating with the previous 50. And 25 of them would have been at the same time. Double. They will always destroy people's uh, reputation. It's just like, that's why every cult leader is a psychopath because all cult leaders operate the right same way. They tell someone in the cult, you're the special one. And then they, they, that one thinks they are, but at the same time they're telling the other one, you're a piece of crap, he's lunatic, she's a lunatic, she's evil, he's evil, she smells. She's, and, and terrible lies, like there's people who would be involved with these, these individuals and these groups would suddenly find out they were a murderer. And they weren't. They, said, they would make up lies like, oh, you know, he killed a guy years ago and he spent years in prison. Like that was one guy contacted me with that story. They was in the office place and one day one day people wouldn't talk to him until he found out that the, the, the eventual psychopath they had in the office had found someone with this, who was the same name as him and the same age in a different part of the country had been convicted of rape, and he told everyone in the office it was him knowing it wasn't. And that's what you're dealing with. And that's how serious it is. And people think, you know, I mean, I'm a very optimistic, probably too much at sometimes, person, and... Uh, I always try to see the good in people, but if you, I always tell people, look, I know I'm probably <laughs> it's the wrong audience for some of you. Don't do unconditional love. Don't do it, whatever you do. All love must be conditional. Only unconditional love any human being should ever have is for their child until they're an adult. Otherwise, it's always be conditional. Always set boundaries in how you deal with people. And don't let anyone ever dehumanize you in order to get something. Because what they do is they're like a fish. When you catch a fish with a hook, they will get you to degrade yourself one little bit to appease them. Really win a bit more. And eventually these, you will be humiliated, degraded, and what's called gaslighting. We're changing your, we'll talk about that in, your, in a minute. Changing your absolute sense of reality until you're on the end of the hook and he's holding you out of water and then he throws you back in, and you don't know who the hell you are, where you came from, or where you're going. Because your whole sense of self has been completely and utterly demolished to the point where you've come out of that relationship, or you've come out of that friendship, or you've come out of that organization, and you don't even know who you are. And that's the, that's the danger, and that's the stakes we're playing, playing for when we're dealing with these people. And you can be the most positive. You can say, I can walk around, say, I believe in love, and if I give out the love. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. 
But if you, you know what you, if, 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 when a person walks around and says, I'm so positive, I, I, I only see the best in everyone, I guarantee you eventually a psychopath will go into you like a vampire, into your, into your jugular vein and take you because you will be seen. One of, those, one of those ones I interviewed for that book, he told me one of the most frightening things I ever heard. He said, I can walk down the street in any town or city and I can tell who was abused as a child or unloved as a child. And I says, how do you know that? He says, there's something about the way they walk. There's a sign of a, a kind of a, a, a loss of stature. He says, I know that their parent either molested them, or abused them, or treat them like crap, or beat them. And he goes, and they're the ones that go looking for. And that's how they think. And they will arrive as the savior. They will arrive as the guardian angel. Right? Now, this... This process doesn't... See, if you can understand, just like me with the serial killers, the process at the bottom of the ladder, it's a scalable process that you can bring all the way to the top. Now, I'll give you an example, right? There's a thing in clinical psychology and uh, criminal psychology called gaslighting. Now, what gaslighting is, is when someone takes control of your consciousness, your psyche, and starts, but basically has you believing black is white. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It'll happen in incremental steps. To the point, a lot of it, it's, it's normally to do with things like money, but are very common. So a man, a, psych, a psychopathic male meets a woman, he finds out she's rich, well, he wants her money, he wants her house, right? Well, if he kills her, he goes to prison, right? So he's not going to, you know, that, that, that's, that's what, like, the stupid psychopaths kill, but the smart ones don't. And they're more dangerous, believe it or not. And so what would happen is, I want the house, so I've got to get her to sign the house over to me, right? And then he'll work out a way to destroy her. Now, it'll be things like, it's, on the surface, it sounds implausible, but if it happens enough times, it'll, it, it, it does work. And the things like the Milgram experiment, where they got people to electrocute a person on the other side of a wall, just because an authority figure told them to do it. And, they, and these subjects, they killed something like 70% of the, they didn't really kill them, they were, had people screaming on the other side. They were pretending to give them electric shocks. 70% of the people did it because it was incrementally done, but also an authority figure told them it was okay, you wouldn't suffer, it'll be okay, don't worry about it. And so what the psychopath will begin to assume authority. So you might be in the car with them, you're driving, they'll start criticizing your driving constantly. Oh, you can't drive properly, you need, well, you just, you'll get us killed, this kind of thing. Get home, uh, it'll start, it's quite spooky when some of the stories you hear, but like you'll hear things like, uh, you know a TV show we were watching the other night, what one? You know, the one where the guy was, uh, he traveled across Australia in a motorcycle and he met this, no. Come on, we were watching a film the other night. The guy was going across Australia in a motorcycle. We, we didn't watch that film. Have you been, you know, have you been smoking something? This kind of thing, you know, that kind of thing, right? This kind of nonsense, right? And you're like, Okay, and then you say, uh, maybe I just forgot. And that will escalate, and I am not joking, to the point where they, you'll be sitting there, on, you, they will walk into the living room, and they'll switch the TV off while you're watching it. And then they'll sit there doing that, and you'll go, why'd you switch the TV off? What? It's still on. You just switch the TV off. I'm watching the, I switched it to another channel, I'm watching the baseball. I'm watching the football. And they're like, huh? And it's the kind of lie that's so extreme that it's so inconceivable to a normal, healthy person to tell that kind of a lie that we start to question, am I going insane? And that's the point. And eventually, eventually, they'll say things like, look, you cannot be having your medication because you're unstable. I'll take care of your medication and dosage and stuff like that. You can't be going out to the shops with your friend, or going out dancing with your friends because you've clearly got perception and psychological problems. You might get killed, you might get raped. And they're sat in, sitting at home saying, he's right, he's right, he's right, he's right, he's right. 
until they've signed the house over, everything, and then the person is genuinely sectioned to a psychiatric hospital because a psychopath has destroyed them. And that's gaslighting. Now that's on the, that's the, I'm telling you right now in this town, there's at least, you know, it, it's happening somewhere in this community. It's happening all over the world. You never hear about it. It's the same reason you never, it's, there's almost no, inf this is also happens in cults. Cults leader, cult leaders do this to, their vic to, the, to the followers. That's why you get so little information about cults afterwards because the, the people who are in there are either too embarrassed they're either too embarrassed to admit that they, were, they did these terrible things for the cult leader and they don't want to talk, often illegal, and you don't want to talk about it, or they've committed suicide, murder by suicide. But that's, this is what they're like. Now let's scale it up to the, the full level, right? Weapons of mass destruction. They started Gulf War II. They had Colin Powell, Tony Blair, and George Bush, and the rest of them, Dick Cheney, all that gang, and the neocons, and they were showing slides saying, and here the bunkers in, you know, Iraq, and you know, weapons and all this. And, and this war is justified in America, freedom and all this crap, right? And they started the war to kill a million and a half people. And then they said, ah, there wasn't really any weapons. Sorry about that. Doesn't matter. We got freedom for Iraq. Yeah, freedom. They killed, you know, this, this, is, this is what it's like. So this is why this subject is so vital. I don't talk about this much anymore because I'm kind of, I, I do other things as well. But I'm kind of glad I was brought to this one because it was, like it was time to talk about it again. If you can scale this up. Now, we're living in a time where you have this guy Trump in America and all the media and everyone is calling him a psychopath, right? Why? Well, he's rude, he's brash. He said something about grabbing one by the post. He's, he, must be, he must be evil, he must be evil, right? No, it's the one who goes... I'm a moral man, I do exactly what you want, I will never offend you. This is why the Pope would, you know, the perfect job for a psychopath would be a Pope. <laughs> I'll never offend you. So my, my thing with Trump is, he, 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 he's an asshole, but give me, that's not a psychopath. He may be dangerous, I don't know, but that, the, one who, the, one who's, the one who does the sing and dance for the, for the public, do you remember, do you remember, do you ever see that? You know what cost Hillary Clinton her, her, her election? Right? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a political eunuch. I don't do left, right, I'm not intra, I hate, I despise politics. I'm totally, I'm probably like a natural anarchist, right? Hillary Clinton, what really cost her that election was a video that appeared from the murder of Muammar Gaddafi, where the camera was rolling and the American news person said to her, Did you hear Gaddafi is dead? And she broke cover, and she went, we came, he saw, he died. And she went, eee! like a real creepy little, like creepy little demon child, screaming. And that's what caused her election, because that's what people said. If you or I behave like that in the public, we'd be sectioned. And that's what's running our world, and that's what's trying, that's what's running our countries. So always remember that. What we, what, what, this is how Jimmy Savile got away with it. Because in the political system, Jimmy Savile is not a weirdo. He... Oh, this is what we're dealing with. You understand? Jimmy Savile, like, Jimmy, if you, if anyone in this audience looked and behaved like Jimmy Savile, right, you'd call the police. He gets a knighthood. <laughs> and yet this guy had ex extreme political power. And that's the absurd thing about it. I recently found a photograph. I actually broke the Irish secret, Government Secrets Act by publicly broadcasting this photo. But there was a photo released years back of Jimmy Savile in Irish government buildings and not dressed like he normally dresses. He was wearing a very nice suit. And he was in the government buildings in 1979 meeting with the then Irish Prime Minister, a guy called Charles Hoy, who was a gun runner and a gangster. And... Uh, an arms dealer, and uh, Savile is clearly in control, right? And I'm saying, this, the picture was scrubbed from the Irish government's, they have, on the, they have a website of photographs of the government buildings through the ages, and they have loads of celebrities who visited and famous dignitaries, and he was on it. I copied the picture and downloaded it and kept it on my hard drive, uh, because I, as soon as the Savile stuff was starting to really get interesting, and I kept it, and they scrubbed it from the site. 
And anyway, he's sitting in a room with this a gun runner, former Prime Minister of Ireland, gun runner, arms dealer, and gangster. And in the middle is a woman called Lady Goulding. Now, Lady Goulding is a, was a member of an Irish billionaire family who were involved in, I'm probably going to get sued for this, but <laughs> a billionaire family involved in petrochemicals and fertilizers. But she was also Winston Churchill's private secretary during World War II. And, her, and she used to, she had the highest security clearance next to the King and William and Churchill in World War II because she used to be a dispatcher running letters between uh, the palace and Downing Street. And here she is in this room with Jimmy Savile, a dopey entertainer. Who, you know, who is this guy? Next thing you see him with the royal family. It dawned on me, Jimmy Savile was a courier. Jimmy Savile was probably moving documentation between London and Dublin during the Troubles because it was, the IRA had intercepted everything on both governments. They had everything intercepted. What better way to do it than a zany celebrity? So he does that. He doesn't care. But that buys him freedom. Freedom to rape children. Freedom to drive around uh, hospitals with cadavers playing racing games, freedom to steal the eyeballs out of corpses in the morgues and make rings from them and go on top of the pops and, do, and it presents the show as jewellery. This is what we're doing. Mocking, mocking. He was going, I'm untouchable. I'm untouchable. A man who I believe we haven't even scraped the essence of his depravity. I believe he was connected to Moore's murderers. I absolutely know he was connected to some of the Yorkshire Ripper killings. And at least one, at least one murder, he was, he was part of it. And he was under investigation for it. But yet, he had Margaret Thatcher go up to Yorkshire and, and take control of the investigation herself. And wrecked it, by the way, I might add, to protect him. Now, that's what happens at the top. And people go, can you believe Jim will fix it did this? Well, think about it. We ignored the warning signs. A guy wearing a tracksuit with down to his is almost his crotch, opened up, bare-chested, big medallion, big long cigar, and then little kids beside him. You know, this kind of thing. You know, just creepy. And you just think, we, we have been gaslighted by the media and the BBC to think, oh, that's just zany. That's just, that's just quirky. But it was just like you saw the truth behind it. You saw the reality, the reality behind it. Now, that's just... He, that, that cover was only broken because he became so pathological and so monstrous that there was just so many victims and so many witnesses, he couldn't hide it anymore. And especially when he did that Louis Thoreau famous, infamous interview, and that, then everyone started to see how utterly strange and weird he was. But it was, that, it was that incremental pathological insanity that brought him to that point. He gets away with molesting one kid, he can move on to a second, third, and we and he acts zany. And instead of us going, I don't want my kids watching a TV show run by a guy with dyed blonde hair, you know, you know, I don't want him around kids. But he did his charity work. Remember, Jimmy was the charity worker. So that was his cover story. How could he be evil? How it's he's a zany, he's a zany, zany celebrity. Until now we know, and we and believe me, that they've held a lot back. And this happens all the time were slowly, incrementally being reduced into a pathological mindset. Now, I'm not trying to scare people because there's a lot of hope out there. And this information can, is very liberating. But this doesn't mean you should walk around thinking, is he one, is she one, is she one? That doesn't work at that at all. Or, or are all politicians like, no, they're not. But what you've got to understand is, when you know the nature of the beast, you're no longer disappointed by it. You know what I mean? You won't get involved in politics. How could this, how could he, how could, how could I be, you know, Tony Blair, New Labour, he shows up at Town Downing Street carrying an electric guitar. Oh, he's the new face of politics. Things are going to be different. And he was Thatcher on steroids. You know? H how could this happen? How, if you understood this, how the world really is now, you wouldn't be disappointed because you'd know he was playing an act. He was gaslighting. He was spooling. He was, he was, putting on a facade. He was putting on a facade. He was giving people what they want because the human beings, we want, we, we see, because of our education system and things like religion, we want to believe that we know it all. 
were right. I voted for that guy or that woman because I'm smarter than the guy who didn't. That's all bullshit. That's how the game is played. That's how you're manipulated. Where if you'd like me, it wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, the only reason I go into a voting booth is to rob the marker. But I wouldn't be bothered, I wouldn't be bothered otherwise at this point. It's a farce or to make a, mock of the, a mockery. But if, if you had a situation like Australia where you're forced to vote, I would just, you know, to crusty the crown as a right in or something. But the political system is set up for them. The, uh, you know, you could have the greatest man or the kindest woman in the world running for a major office. It doesn't matter. Because let me tell you how government really works. The power is... You remember that TV show, Yes, Minister? It really showed you that the power was who? The civil servants. And the civil, senior civil service in every government in the world is... You, wouldn't, you want to find where it's top-heavy with psychopaths? That's where it is. They don't have to run for election, so therefore they don't have to be found out. They don't have, in civil services, not like corporations. You can basically, by serving, by time served and doing all the courses they tell you, you, you'll get to the top. So you don't have to try anything, right? You don't, you'll get there. So you don't have to, like in a corporation, it's harder for them because they actually have to work harder to get there. And so this is where, and so it doesn't matter who you vote in. It's all these NGOs and who's below that, that where the danger is. And then these supernat supernatural, super, supernatural, <laughs> supernatural or operations, these, you know, the, the Trilateral Commission, so on, the Bilderbergs. Now, do you remember, like, the Bilderbergs, they used to tell us that was a conspiracy. A top Irish journalist in 2000, uh, this, the, the, one of the biggest journalists, uh, I got talking to him in a ca in about a completely different subject, and, and we were talking about, like, the euro coming in, and I, and I said to this guy, I said, yeah, but, you know, it's really, you know, it's really the, 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 the big money who's moving this stuff around, like the Bilderbergs. And he goes, you don't believe that, do you? What? That the Bilderbergs exist. And I said, for Christ's sake, they have a website. <laughs> he had been gaslighted by being told everything is conspiracy theory. You know what I'm saying? Without checking. This is how, this is how, how nasty it is, you know? You, I mean, there was an awful story in one of the... Uh, Eli Weissel's stories of the Holocaust, where there were elderly German men walking up to uh, the SS officers in the death camps and saying, wait until Mr. Hitler finds out what you're doing. You'll be in trouble. You know, and these things were happening in Mao's China, Kampuchea, Pol Pot. This is what they're like. This is, they, they, they depend on our decency and our kindness to keep their monstrosity going. And this is where you have to be really, really careful. You have to be, you have to be very, you know, very mature and saying like, you know, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn seems like a very nice man, and he, if he became prime minister, maybe he is would be a good man, but he's still in a system that's rotten to the core, and that's not going to change over his, you know, over his uh, lifetime or anything like that or any other decent politician. And this is why I have no, I have no faith in the political system because, again, it's the triangular hierarchy. Right Now, our ancestors in indigenous societies, and remember, we as Europeans are indigenous too, in case you've forgotten that, they had a circular structure. And there was abs you know, and there's no point along a radius that's in charge. It's almost like a perpetual motion of ideas and information. That's why the best structures that work. But we're so far from that, because education has made us into something that can't function without this process. This is why they have a student, as soon as you enter, you see children as soon as they go, they enter school, the, the purpose is to take the life out of them, to kill them, and also to identify ones who are really smart and make sure they don't do well. And when I say smart, I mean creatively smart, the ones who can think for themselves. This is why they have you doing times tables, one, two is two, two, two is two. This is marching in your brain. And it puts you into a situation for the rest of your life where you're basically following us. It's extremely difficult. Now, when did this all start? Well, it started really, I mean, I'm not only defending anyone's religion, but I'm, you know, it started when Abrahamic religions really came into Europe because they brought this hierarchical system. Our pagan ancestors had gods and goddesses, and they were all metaphors, archetypes for natural functions and all this kind of thing. And suddenly you had this one psychopath in the heavens called Jehovah. And Jehovah said, do this, or I'll blow you to bits. Do this, or I'll set you fire. Do this, or I'll give you a plague. Prove you love me. Now, hey, you want to hear a psychopath? 
Abraham, get Isaac, hold the knife over his head and kill him to show you love me. And the last minute he goes, stop, no, I'm joking. And that's our, that's our God. You know, and, that's where, and that gives them a mandate. If you look at the most horrific persecutions, when the Cathars you know, were annihilated, and they were a Christian sect in southern Europe, they were annihilated by the so-called Christian crusaders. They, they, they were, they, when they went through their towns killing everybody, they were enacting Sodom and Gomorrah. They were enacting Jericho. Because the mandate from this, this, you know, this, this, this Abrahamic God had put that out there. That's why I'm a, you know, I'm a pagan. I consider myself a pagan or a heathen, and I, my identity is with that. I don't, you know. But when you have Gore Vidal was right when he said well, it, monotheism was the greatest catastrophe for humanity because one god in heaven equals one king, one emperor, one pope, one boss, one manager, and it's just you know those Russian dolls where you get one inside the other. Well, it's a Russian doll of path pathology and control. You know, and this is, this is we are so programmed. And, it's not, and when you step outside it, then you, when you start to see outside this stuff, you really realize how bizarre the world actually is. Now, you know, it's so funny that, like, the, the world, how it functions under this system, this, like, this kind of, like, psychopathic system, is actually more bizarre than the, the most crazy supernatural theory you could come up with. You know, that's, it's actually more bizarre than that. Now, back to possibly, now I, well, I'm, I'm, I have to be very, I have a lot of caution here to possibly identify them because we don't want people in a state of paranoia where it's like a witch hunt or anything like that, but possibly. Again, I spoke with the, the, the example I gave you at the beginning, someone at work, but look for it in politicians and look for it in any, any your job or anything. You don't really know who they are. You can't find their past history. They'll tell you, oh, well, I was there. You don't even, you might be married to them and find that they had a completely different name. They'll tell you, oh, well, I was in an ashram in India and I changed my name to Govinda, whatever. And it turns out you find out that he was in prison for, for rape or for murder and a completely different name. Be very careful with this kind of thing, and uh, that's, you know, and this is what causes the most damage to people when they put all their emotional or belief or spiritual belief or financial belief in somebody who didn't exist—a phantom, a chimera. They didn't exist. You have no idea how psychologically devastating that is. It's, it's horrific. That's where a lot of suicides come from in this kind of business and stuff. There was a, a, I remember there was one high profile suicide around the Clintons. And when the Clintons got first elected, he kill, uh, killed himself in his car. And he was like, well, he was the right hand man. And his, and his farewell letter was that people in politics are not real. They say they're one person, but when they get into power, they change suddenly. His, 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 his suicide letter said something like that. He had probably just seen, they didn't need him anymore. And they said, get out of my face. I'm president now. Get away from me. And the rest is in, you know, dead men tell no tales. And uh, it's darker than you can even imagine. And this is not conspiracy theory. Uh, there's nothing I've said here that you cannot verify with your own eyes, the police records, or anything. This is the, how the world is. And the altering of reality is central to that. So that's like, you, you often can't tell who they are or where they came from. N you know, they're, they're, their biography is all over the place. And you can't pin it down. You can't even find who they were. They are great cover stories because they have left a trail of destruction behind them. They have, like I said earlier on, a lot of the males when they'll tell you that every single female they're involved with was a psycho or was a nut job, a whack job. Oh, she's a wacko. I used to I used to work with one guy like that. What happened? What happened to what's her name? Oh, she's crazy. She's a wacko. And then the next one, what happened to her? Oh, she's a nutcase. My second wife was a nutcase. My third, this kind of thing. And you realize that that's just to immediately destroy any kind of paper trail you can work through to find out who they are because you already think in your head that uh, you know, they're already dysfunctional or they're guilty. They can't be trusted. Like you have an organization, say money goes missing, right? And say a genuine individual in the organization says there's a few thousand pounds missing. 
and uh, they call a meeting together. Now, the guy, and they're saying, there's, there's money missing from the account. The psychopath who stole it would say, well, James, that's a really nice new car you got, isn't it? It's on a plumber's salary. You understand? And he says, what are you insinuating? Nothing. I just say it's a really nice car you got. Now, we're here to discuss the missing money. Oh, okay. You were kind of nervous about that, weren't you? And he says, I didn't take the money. Then why are you so nervous? This, they'll have a plan to, to literally accuse an innocent person. And before the meeting ever took place, they will start saying things to the ones on the phone or privately. Say, the guys, George is his name, that he wants, the psychopath wants to blame on him. He'll say, you know, George is really messed up. He used to be a big time cocaine head. He was, uh, he sent millions up his nose. Lies, all lies. And then the other ones, I never heard that. And he says, oh no, it's true. But he's, he seems nice. Oh, he got himself together. Don't get me wrong. He's a nice guy. He got himself together. Then he tells somebody else, you know, George, you know, uh, I don't know. We, we told, he told the joke the other day and it was very inappropriate. But you've told jokes that are worse. Yeah, but there's something creepy about the way he told. You know, this kind of thing. To demolish the man's humanity until the point that he cannot effectively challenge the guilty individual who's a psychopath. This is very common, very common. It's a, it's a level of evil we can't under, even begin to... Well, to even say it's evil, it's, I don't even know what... Well, it is evil from our perspective, but it's, it's, a, it's a feral impulse. It's, it's, it's like a wild animal trying to survive. But instead of surviving in the jungle, they're surviving in... They're surviving in the psychic world that we inhabit. And, it's a, it, it, and you see it... You see it in hints. It's almost like you never, until they actually fully reveal, and maybe one, if, you know, like in the case of Saville, they are arrested, and it all, or not arrested, he wasn't arrested, but it all comes out eventually. But all along it's been revealed, and what you're seeing is not the actual, the predator, but you're seeing almost like the shadow of the, 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 the aspect of the predator. Now this brings up another idea. I spoke earlier on about you shouldn't unconditionally love anyone except that your child. That's the only one you should unconditionally love until they're an adult. After that, it's conditional. And another aspect of that is this idea of this idea of a kind of a, a hope in humanity. I know that, I'm not trying to be negative, but that, of course humanity has hope and anything like that. But you, if you have this idea that you will find a savior or you will find, again, that's Christianity. You know, the man from heaven comes down, do what you're told, get your baptism, baptism and boom, you get into heaven. You know, it's all these conditions, all these conditions are put on us. It's the idea of superficiality. Like, I would trust somebody, and you should trust somebody, who walks up to you one day and goes, you know what, you really, and on genuinely, when you did screw up, and they, they, they did it, and they tell you you screwed up, because that's honest. And you should also trust people who are naive. That's one of the things, like, Irish people all get, you know, Irish people in, ter in Ireland, people are very naive, especially in the rural areas. But that's a good thing, that means they're honest. But when you have a complex urban society, and you have a complex society like we do on the internet, you have this belief, and it's been cultivated through psychiatry, that we're all supposed to be happy. And we're never supposed to be negative. And we're never supposed to be angry. Don't be angry, right? Now, because of the collective unconscious nature of society, when people are all like, everything is love, everything is wonderful. You don't make the dark side go away. All you do is you put it under the ground like a pressure cooker. And it will build like a volcano. On a personal level, you, we've all met them. This person who's like, Mr. I'm so loving, I'm so wonderful. And then they blow up one day and they're like the Ned, there's a famous episode of The Simpsons where Ned Flanders goes from hey diddly diddly to a psychiatric hospital. That's true. Carl Jung is right. You cannot suppress the shadow. But we've been, we've been trained and conditioned to suppress the shadow. Now on a, collectively, on a collective conscious level, when you suppress the shadow, you will generate a society with more psychopaths in them because you don't get them in indigenous cultures. You just don't get them. And I'll tell you why, they kill them. 
they kill him. The Inuit word for psychopath literally translates as the one who stays behind, rapes the women, and steals our stuff while we're out hunting. It literally translates that. We've always known about them. They're all over mythology. They're all over mythology. We're warned about these types. We do not let them get, we, we banish them from the tribe because they will destroy. It's very easy for us today, we're complex. But if you have an indigenous tribe where it's a matter of life and survival, it's very tight, it's like that. You cannot have a disruptive force because the whole tribe, now I'm not saying we should get psychopaths or anything like that, we should banish them personally from our lives because they will never change and don't have this thing, oh God love them, they're so healthy, you know, we need, they're not like that, they'll just find somewhere else to pray on. And um, when you have an indigenous society, it's tight, it's really tight. So you have any disruption to that, it destroys it. Now, I have a friend in Scandinavia who was a, who was a, uh, she was a maternity nurse, sorry, a midwife and in a rural community. And she said, and she, she read my book and contacted me, we became friends. And she says, you know, when I was delivering babies and bringing them to the mothers, every so often, there was a baby that didn't feel right. There was, it didn't feel right, the baby. Now you hear this thing, all children are born innocent. Didn't feel right. And she said, when I'd hand it to the mother, and it would breastfeed, it was almost like, give me that. You understand? There was no loving bonding between the mother and the child. It was a predator type. And she said, in every case, every one of them that were like that ended up in prison. Before. They were all criminals. They were all violent. They were all, they, you know, they, they were, they were, she said, I could tell as a baby. Every so often, one out of a hundred, one out of 500, would be like that. And, they were, and, and sure enough, you could set your clock by them. By the time they, they were having sex at 12 and 13, they were robbing cars at 14, they were having their first criminal things at certain age. They were all, animal torture is a common one. They, they all seemed to kill animals and torture them as, as young kids. Very, very common, even if it's just insects. They, but it's not even like a, a, young, a kid, sometimes a kid will have a natural insect and, and see, a, see a bee and go like that, kill it. No, he'll make a plan on how to kill a certain animal. He'll make traps, and he'll enjoy the rush, and that rush will then move on to another rush, and a bigger trill, and a, because they're like a junkie that has a niche that can never be scratched. They're tracing a, a dragon of pathology. And, you know, they're chasing this monster inside them, that, this demon inside them that constantly feeds. And in our Western society, because we don't have the same kind of uh, necessity of survival in the same way, where we let them slip through, or we all think, God, all children are all innocent. Well, our ancestors never thought that, never. Do you ever hear about changelings and things like that? In rural Ireland, the idea of like, the mothers would not, would not take care of the baby because says, that's not my baby. There's something else in there. That is not, that is not our child. You know, and now they, they medicate, in the, then now they medicate those mothers and lock them up. You know, because the mothers knew there was something not right with that kid. There was no connection. And then as the kid grew older, things would happen like uh, the, the little kid would not respond to the mother or spend all day screaming. This is a very common story with serial killers. If you interview the mothers or read the profiles of serial killer mothers, they will say the baby screamed and screamed all day long. All day long, nonstop, until daddy came home and went, daddy. And when the mother tried to turn around and say, he was, he, he's driving me mad, he was screaming all day. He goes, what are you on about? He's a perfect kid. Almost from the womb, they know how to mess with people's heads. And that's really spooky. And that's really spooky. So are we dealing with an entity? If you were to ask me this, seven, eight years ago when the book Puzzling Khabibah came out and I was doing a lot of mainstream stuff, I would have, I'm not going there, I'm not talking about it. But I got news for you. At this stage in the game, yeah, there's not a human in there. There's something else going on. I don't know what it is. It's like an invasion of the body snatchers thing. But I actually got more, I actually, okay, and he's, he's giving me five minutes. I actually got more information from things like demonology than I did from criminal psychology when I tried to see there was a kind of an element to it. Now, I'll leave you quickly with the, the antidote to it, right? The first one is, 
a sense of humor. They don't get jokes and they don't get complex satire. If you tell a joke that has a complex satirical nature to it, like I went to the moon and I had, you know, I went to the moon and I rode a dinosaur and then we got into a spaceship and I had, you know, sex with John Collins' ghost, they'd be like, what? You understand that like they would watch things like Monty Python and wouldn't get it, right? That's the antidote because we can actually develop a kind of a lexicon that we can operate underneath their radar. They cannot get for whatever, and that's actually shown in demonology that demons don't get jokes or satire. That's another spooky thing about it. Now another one, right? That's an important one, but also a connection with nature. They don't seem to have a connection, a proper, oh, they'll pretend they do. They'll buy all the latest camping gear and all this, this kind of thing, but they won't have it, they won't have it. They won't feel it. And I recently, I did something stupid recently, but it was one of the best things in my life. I got lost in the Odenwald Forest in Germany for two days. I went over and I just walked for two days living like a wild man because I said this would be the last chance of my life I'd probably get to do something like this. And I spent two days hiking over the mountains and I was transported into a different realm. It was a shift in consciousness I'd never experienced anywhere else in my life. And these forests of the Odenwald, they were not a full, full of wolves and everything. I wasn't scared or anything like that. And I was, there's a, 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 the legend of the Wildenbicken, the wild woman of the forest. And she, the Christians were terrified of her but the pagans were, saw her as the kind of forest mother. And after the first night, waking up in the morning, I was surrounded by this sense that I was not going to be under any danger because this forest spirit archetype of the Wildenbicken was around with me. And even when I got back from Germany, I felt amazing and wonderful. And all I've been doing is thinking about trying to get back there. Every time I think, I can't wait, I wanna go, I wanna go so back there because it was a world outside our bullshit. You understand? It was a real world. And in a real world, a psychopath can't exist. And then people get all upset about politics. They're all terrible. I know so many people already slashed their wrists over Donald Trump. I was delighted that Donald Trump won. Two reasons. Hillary Clinton scared me more. And secondly, I knew it was going to be great entertainment. We're living on a global episode of Father Ted. You could not ask for better. <laughs> Enjoy it, enjoy it, okay? No, it's true, it's true. Enjoy it. So, if you feel you're dealing with a psychopath, don't co directly confront them. Learn that this is how the world is, and you will never ever have political idealism. You'll see it all, and you'll have a happier and better life. Get connected to nature and develop a spiritual identity that's not based on hierarchy and orthodoxy. And as I say to everybody, feck him if you can't take a joke. Thanks very much. <laughs> Someone share it in. Great stuff, thank you very much. Brilliant.